I think we're live. As you can see, everyone, we're still getting used to this, still getting used to the programs. I won't actually know that I'm live until I see myself. There's a slight, I think, 15 to 20 second delay. Right now it says live in two minutes on, uh, on, the, app, on the screen that I'm looking at on my other computer. Okay, well, I see us now. All right, so we are still figuring this out as we go along. Um, but I, I think we'll, we'll have it all down in a week. We're trying a couple different things. Um, we do want to do a quick sound test here in a second. If, if, you're, if you are new here, we've only been doing this two days. Um, we're using a lot of new programs, a lot of new setups so that we can go live. Anthony and I both normally post videos where we record it on our own. We take our time. We take time with the editing and so on. And that's actually my preferred format. If you listen to me speak extemporaneously, I fumble over words and so on. I have to pause and think, especially if I'm using a lot of controls for different things. And so I actually like sitting down and getting every word exactly the way I want it. And if I have to record something over and over again so that I don't make any mistake, I'll sit there and do that. Sometimes I'll sit there recording a video for hours so that I can get it exactly the way I want it. Um, because once you've finally gotten that, then everything is as condensed as possible. It's as, it's as short as you want, given the content that, that you're, you're trying to put out there. Uh, but there are people who prefer a more conversational um, approach and something more interactive. And so we want to have both. We want to make our, um, our carefully crafted videos, but we also like to try going live here and there. And so for just two weeks and then we'll we're gonna we're, we're gonna reassess the situation after that for two weeks anthony and i are going to go live during weekdays so the rest of this week um so that'll be uh tonight and tomorrow and then we'll start again on monday go monday through friday and then a few days the following week and then we'll figure out if we want to keep up keep it up going nightly or just make it once or twice per week something like that um so that's a situation here uh, let me do a quick sound test, and then we'll get some uh, some uh, some of Anthony's background here. Um, how do, how does the sound set? See, I, I checked the sound. I don't even know why I'm asking because I asked everyone about the sound yesterday, and people said it sounded fine. And uh, then I listened to it, and I thought the sound was fairly bad. Now, it can be bad. Sound can be bad in different ways. If it's if it sounds so bad that you can't understand what's being said, that's like that's like awful. But then you have it sounding bad to where you hear some background noise or the sound sounds uh distorted or something like that that's what you generally want to avoid in fact i just see right now a source of background noise um so uh anyway give us some comment comments uh i'm gonna make a few modifications real quick while anthony talks but uh give us some information about the the sound as we go on because I'm, I'm trying to i'm trying to work on like one thing per day like tomorrow we're going to try video clips we're going to try watching video clips um i can't focus on much more than one or two things per day because i get really confused with all these uh all these windows and controls open in front of me so right now i want to focus on sound because the general rule is if this if, if the sound is messed up everything else is messed up people can put up with uh, bad video quality if your video is too dark or something like that and they they can't see very well what's going on as long as they can hear you clearly but you could have the most beautiful video in the world and if the sound is garbled and people can't understand what you're saying it's 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 awful so sound is of primary importance that's why we would want to work on that at the beginning uh, so so give us some feedback on that as we go along and then i can look at the comments uh later uh anthony people are more familiar with me on my channel than they are with you on my channel even though you've you've had many v videos posted on my channel uh, most people are far more familiar with me because they've been watching uh, me some of them for eight or nine years or something like that um, so people know me as this like criminal background loser who became a Christian um, why don't you share just for you know two or three minutes a little bit about your background so they get to know who is Anthony Rogers? Yeah, well, first let me say, uh, since most people on here will know you through YouTube, we've actually been uh, working together in one way or another for quite a long time. I was trying to remember how far back it goes. I, I might need to, to take a minute to, to pinpoint the first encounter, but 
Uh, I started writing for Answering Islam, I think it was back in 2008, but I don't think it was until later that I noticed you were also a contributor on Answering Islam. So you were there prior to me, but uh, so we, we at least were contributing to the same website uh, for quite a while. And then over time, I, I gravitated over to your blog, Answering Muslims, and eventually, and I don't know the date on this either, you brought me on as a contributor uh, and and then you had the foresight to start doing things on YouTube, and we're continuing that as we continued to write on the blog, and then eventually sort of uh, uh, slowed down in your your contributions to the blog, uh, even though it's still up and running. Uh, but yeah, so we've been doing things together for quite a while. We've even uh, participated at times in uh, debates, uh, for example, the Chino Hills debates with uh, Shadid Lewis. Uh, anyways. Um, yeah, so my background, I grew up in Orange County, California. Uh, I was involved in uh, gangs in my uh, teen years. Uh, and for that reason, my parents decided to move to Las Vegas, Nevada. They thought if they removed me from my environment, then they would somehow change my behavior. And anyone who's familiar with the, the doctrine of man in Scripture knows that's simply uh, false. You know, Scripture teaches that uh, man is prone to evil, we we're born sinful, and so simply changing my environment wasn't going to change anything about my nature. I was con going to continue to be uh, the kind of person that I was and, and pursue the uh, path that I was pursuing already. And so as soon as we moved to Vegas, I quickly fell in with the same group of people. I uh, started to run with gangs, uh, become involved in all sorts of criminal activity, including uh, theft, and one of the things that we did quite frequently was steal cars. I remember looking back at one point and realizing that I stole enough cars to fill up a grocery store parking lot. And none of this was for gain. Uh, this was actually when I finally did get caught. Uh, it was one of the things that really gnawed at me because I, I was surrounded by other convicts. And, and you'll probably know this uh, as well as I do, David, but uh, uh, I you hear the different excuses that people have. People would say, I grew up in a, in a bad family. And, you know, that was supposed to be the uh, explanation for why they, and justification for why they're where they're at now. And I remember listening to that thinking, I didn't grow up in a bad family. I had, a, I had great parents. Uh, then I'd hear somebody else say something like, we were poor, and so I had to steal to survive. And I'd, I'd listen to that and I'd think, gosh, we weren't poor. Uh, I don't have that excuse either. And so one by one, I'd hear these people make these excuses and I realized even though those aren't justifications, they're not true grounds for engaging in criminal activity, uh, I don't even have those makeshift excuses to justify me uh, before God. And so at the same time, and this is actually uh, quite providential as I look back on it, uh, I was put in a cell with a a self-professed devil worshiper, and he was trying to tell me things about the Bible, and I, I I didn't really know the Bible, but I said, that doesn't sound to me like it's true. It just sounds to me like you've got an ax to grind, and so he actually challenged me to take up a Bible and read it, and I'd see that what he's telling me is true, because he couldn't show me it either. He said, but if I read it, then I'll find the things he's talking about, so I picked up the Bible and started reading it, and as I did so, the only thing that uh, I kept seeing was there's a God who's perfectly just and holy. He hates all sin, and he'll by no means clear the guilty. And so I read of stories of God uh, destroying the world in uh, you know, a great deluge and uh, only eight people surviving. Uh, I read of God opening up the ground and swallowing uh, whole families alive, uh, fire shooting out from God's presence when somebody tried to approach him in an un unauthorized way. And all of this just, uh, you know, frightened me to no end. I thought I couldn't even escape human justice, even though I thought I was unstoppable. And here I am uh, guilty before a God who's got all of heaven and earth at his disposal. And so I eventually desired to sleep as much as I could. But then even when I went to sleep, I'd be frightened awake by something I saw in my dream. I mean, I don't claim that they were prophetic dreams or anything, but uh if you, you know the story of uh, Nero, he had such a uh, guilt-ridden conscience that even when the leaves rustled, he, he got frightened be, you know, because he thought that uh, his doom was nigh. Well, uh, that was the state I was in. 
And it wasn't until I heard somebody preach the gospel of Christ uh, and, and uh, explained how Christ paid the penalty for sin. He lived a perfect life. And through faith in him, God imputes his righteousness to us and accounts us as just that I, I finally understood uh, the gospel. And I believed and was saved and ever since have been uh, serving Christ. And one other thing I would add is it was in that context uh, where I, I was converted in prison where I first became interested in evangelism and apologetics because I was surrounded by uh, a number of non-Christian groups, including including Muslims, the Nation of Islam, Ekankar, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, you name it. Every group was represented in the prison. And particularly in the case of Islam, is, uh, the Muslims there didn't have a heart change. Islam can't change the heart. Uh, but it gave a lot of them a religious veneer through which to express their hatred and hostility. So many people in the prisons gravitated towards Islam because it gave them justification for being hostile towards other people, uh, especially uh, Christians. So uh, that was my experience, and it also uh, gave me a backbone, I would say. You know, I never, because I came from the streets, I was never really afraid of much, uh, but becoming a Christian in prison where it wasn't popular to do so, many people think that, if you become a Christian in prison, you know, you'll get some kind of special favor. Actually, it was the opposite. Christians were uh, towards the bottom of the totem pole. Uh, there are only a few classes of people, as you know, that are lower than Christians. Uh, but so I, I experienced a great deal of uh, opposition and uh, learned from that never to be afraid uh, and to testify of Christ in any situation. So, All right. Well, that is, let me see here. If I can switch it back, pow! Man, I'm good. Hey, but now we're reversed. That's weird. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna be cracking up at learning uh, what what all these uh, buttons do when I click on them because uh, some of these I'm clicking for the uh, for the first time. Um, so anyway, that that was uh, that was helpful, Anthony. And, and yeah, mine's a little similar as far as uh, prison actually having a certain. Uh, builds up some good qualities that be, that can become helpful if you're confronting, um, especially if you're confronting dangerous ideologies. You, ju you just end up not scared of anything. It's like, like David, we're going to hurt you. Oh, guys, I spent years in prison around murderers and rapists and drug dealers and everything else. You really think I'm scared of a keyboard jihadi, right? So anyway, uh, good time. <laughs> but, um, now, uh, just so everyone knows, and I think I think we have the major sound problems taken care of. Um, someone was mentioning background noise. There's actually an, an air conditioner over to the side of me because it's boiling up here. I think, I, uh, think that's taken care of. Yesterday, there was like a, a, a clicking sound as comments were coming in. I turned off sound effects, so I think that problem is solved. And we might, we might have all of the main sound issues taken care of so we can focus on some other things as we're going on. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you're just tuning in, we're kind of experimenting with a new setup. So um, we're going to be asking for feedback as we go along so that we know how everything thing sounds. We know how everything looks. We know how the people, whether people like certain aspects of the format or not. And we will adapt as time goes on. Now, I wanted to try one more thing new, and that is... I think if I click on a comment, I can actually insert it into the video. Let me try it. Ah, oh, look at that. I won't know if it. I won't know if it actually came up on your screen until I see it over here. There's like a 15 to 20 second delay. But Anthony, we had a question that that actually uh, follows up on what you just said. Uh, David, why become a Christian? So, um, what do you think? Why should someone become a Christian, Anthony? Yeah, well, the obvious answer is because it's true, and so the follow-up would be, how do we know that it's true? And there are a number of ways a person can go uh, about arguing for this. Uh, first, I'd just say, since I just gave my testimony, uh, my personal persuasion of the truth of Christianity was that I recognized that it spoke the truth about my own heart, the reality of my sin, and brought conviction. And so the necessity of the atonement of Christ by virtue of God's law, which is written not only in Scripture, but in uh, my conscience. And so uh, those sorts of things rang true to me. That, that obviously isn't the only thing that we would say. We believe there is objective public evidence for the truth of Christianity, uh, but I don't think that's insignificant simply because, uh, you know, it's not the same sort of thing most people are looking for when they think of evidence. 
Uh, but as, as far as evidence goes, and, and you've done this uh, numerous times, uh, and, and we'll probably want to chime in on this, but we would point to the reality of Christ's uh, crucifixion and resurrection. Uh, the crucifixion, of course, the, the best attested and most widely acknowledged historical fact about Jesus, not even uh, questioned except by fringe scholars like, uh, um, uh, what's his name? I can't even think of his name. He's such a fringe scholar. <laughs> uh uh, Richard Carrier. In any case, um, uh, yeah, so the crucifixion of Christ is uh, widely attested, uh, firmly entrenched in historical fact. And so the, the question really only is, did Jesus actually rise from the dead? A fact predicted in the Old Testament, predicted by Jesus, and uh, we would say attested not only through uh, multiple witnesses in the New Testament, uh, witnesses who are will, willing to seal their testimony with their blood, something you wouldn't expect when somebody is talking about an empirical uh, fact, right? I mean, you could have people that might die for an ideology that they're persuaded is true, but no person's going to willingly lay down their life for something they claim to have seen, but no, they didn't see. And so we at least know that the authors of the New Testament believed that they witnessed the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They saw him in his glorified, resurrected body. And uh, so uh, at that point, I mean, the question becomes, were they simply deceived or uh, were they in fact telling the truth? And the deception idea simply doesn't work. Uh, I mean, there, there are any number of ways a person might claim they were deceived. The most popular would be to say something like they saw a hallucination. Uh, but the problem with that is you have people, uh, if the disciples were uh, going to have hallucinations, then they're not likely going to have hallucinations of something that doesn't comport with their background beliefs. And, and the background beliefs of the disciples wasn't that the Messiah would die and rise again uh, three days later. They actually expected the resurrection to be something that took place at the end of the age. And the Messiah was uh, somebody who was going to come and conquer the Romans and establish Jewish hegemony and so forth. Uh, so a hallucination of Christ risen uh, would have been contrary to all expectations. Uh, as well, you have the fact that uh, the, the resurrection of Christ was witnessed by not only one person, not only on one occasion, but by multiple people on multiple occasions. So, I mean, there, there's just a, a wealth of information, uh, evidentially, that points to the reality of uh, Christ's resurrection. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't even say that's uh, all there is to the case that could be made for Christianity. Uh, there's, there's a lot more that could be said, but uh, that, that would be for starters. All right. Uh, wanted to acknowledge uh, Super Chatters here real quick. Uh, Lily says, uh, sounds good. Um, sound is good. God bless David and Anthony. Thank you, Lily. And Jordan Marshall actually um, had a request. He said, hey, David, two things. Can you tell us the story of showing the evidence of Jesus' death to Nabil's dad in the religious circle? And two, how to take down Muhammad and the Quran in one statement or phrase. Um, so, Anthony, if you want to think about how to take down Muhammad and the Quran in one statement or phrase, I would have to think about that one because I've never, uh, I've never been in a situation where I only have access to one statement or phrase. Uh, but as far as uh, I think the story that you're referring to is uh, a situation where uh, Nabil's dad... Um, came over with Nabil to Mike Lacona's house. And Mike Lacona was there with Gary Habermas. And uh, so it was me, Nabil, Gary Habermas, um, Mike Lacona, and Nabil's dad. And the situation was, um, I'm always asking Muslim questions about what they believe and why they believe and um, what sort of evidence is important to them, what would surprise them. Um, because people are people are different and they respond to different things. And so when I first met Nabil, he was telling me that, uh, you know, the uh, Islam is proven true by logic and history and science and mathematics and everything in the world proves that Islam is true. And if you just examine it with an open mind, you'll see that it's true. And uh, so we got into a variety of discussions along the way. And uh, one day I, I, I even remember we were in the, the room that was the, the meeting place for our for our uh, speech and debate team and I asked him uh, what would what would bother you if, if you saw it right what, what would make you start to doubt that Islam is true if it if it happened because I'm trying to find out what, what sort of what sort of evidence would would qualify as a problem for Islam with him and Nabil said that he has so much respect for his 
dad that if he saw his dad sort of backed into a corner or, or unable to answer, then he would he would start to have a problem. He would start to he, he would have to wonder um, whether uh, he has good reasons for believing in Islam because he had really had a lot of confidence in Islam because of what his dad had told him while he was growing up. So obviously, if his dad didn't know what he was talking about, then he might have to start rethinking things. So uh, anyway, I knew Mike Lacona was uh, working on a book. That's the, the case for the resurrection of Jesus. You can, you can still get that um, with Gary Habermas. And so I invited <laughs> Nabil to, uh, to bring his dad over. And there was supposed to be someone else there, some, some, uh, some Muslim scholar who was going to come with them. So Nabil, the, the original plan was for uh, me and Nabil to moderate the discussion between Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona on the one hand and Nabil's dad and uh, another Muslim on the other hand. And uh, somehow right at the end, the, uh, the other Muslim uh, couldn't make it. And so the idea was I would kind of moderate the discussion and it would be Nabil and his dad on, on one side and Gary and Mike on the other. And so uh, that discussion went on for a while. And I was actually getting slightly annoyed because uh, Gary and Mike were being much too nice, right? I mean, you, I could tell that Nabil's dad or Nabil would say something, and they could absolutely annihilate it. I know they could, but they were trying to be nice, right? They weren't trying to, to hurt anyone's feelings. So they just kept letting them go over and over again, making these uh, uh, very strange points. And, uh, and it was getting towards the end, and I was like, gosh, Gary and Mike are, are almost just letting Nabil and, and Nabil's dad dominate the discussion the entire time. So what's going on here? And uh, finally, uh, Nabil's dad mentioned as evidence that Jesus survived crucifixion, uh, the Shroud of Turin. And so he brought up the Shroud of Turin there. And uh, then Gary sort of just perked up and went into a different mode and said, wait, you're granting, you, you believe that the Shroud of Turin is authentic? And Nabil's dad said, yes. And Gary turned to Nabil and said, do you agree? You believe that the Shroud of Turin is authentic? And Nabil said, yes. And then Gary said, uh, well, then, then you've got quite a problem here because uh, uh, I've written three books on that. And let me tell you what the Shroud of Turin actually shows. And then so Gary just went on this awesome tirade of all the details in the Shroud of Turin that would show conclusively that, that someone, whoever was in the Shroud, uh, was dead. And so just, just to be clear, there are people who don't believe that the shroud is authentic. But if you grant that the shroud is authentic, then you run into all kinds of issues. Um, like the, like uh, uh, there's clear evidence that rigor mortis had set in, which that happens when you die. Uh, there's evidence that the, that the serum and the, the blood had started separating, which that means you're dead. So there are all these kinds of issues that, that show that whoever was in the shroud, if it's authentic, and Nabil and his dad were granting that it is, uh, would require the person to be dead. And so that sort of finished the discussion on that note, and I was very happy, and Nabil's dad had to leave. He said, I had to leave. And uh, Nabil said, can I stay? And Nabil's dad said, no, I need you at home. I didn't think he needed him home, but I think that, that he was getting nervous that, that Nabil was uh, going to get some information that would cast doubt on Islam. So that was that, that, was that situation. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I, you have to have massive respect for both Nabil and his dad for, for being willing to go in there and talk to two Christians who specialize in his historical Jesus study. So that was, that was, uh, that was really cool. And uh, fortunately, um, it, it, it turned out well. So Anthony, did, did, did you make any uh, headway on how to, how to take down Muhammad and the Quran in one statement or phrase? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can think of a couple things. Uh, one, Muhammad claimed to be the paragon of moral virtue, but uh, he's not someone you'd want to live next door. Uh, you'd want to live next door to you, your wife, or your six-year-old daughter. That is one sentence. Uh, so that's not you didn't that, get it one phrase, but that is that would be one sentence. Yeah, I was thinking sentence. Um, but I also thought what I could do is, uh, but I don't know if people can can do this, sort this out mentally. But I thought of uh, a sentence with a lot of semicolons and. Colons and, and oh yeah, so you could forth. do that. Like like uh, <laughs> like you could have a whole paragraph that's lots of but, uh, dashes and parent, 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 parenthetical claims and so on. Yeah, we could do it that way. Uh, so, yeah, so so there yeah. there are lots of ways you could do that. You could say uh, Muhammad affirmed scriptures that contradict his fundamental message, and therefore his religion self destructs. That's that's easily one sentence when 
punctuate it accordingly. But go ahead. You had some, you had another one? Or Yeah, well, another one would be the Bible uh, teaches us to reject any self-proclaimed prophet who comes speaking in the name of another god. And according to both the Old and New Testaments, God is a father, but the God of Islam is not a father. Therefore, uh, Muhammad was a false prophet. Um, I, I think you could do that with any of the arguments we make. Obviously, you'd want to fill it in to give a uh, you know full case and, and be persuasive. But I mean, you could use any one of these things to you know sow some doubt or get a person thinking. A um, couple of super chatters here. Alan Rule says, uh, God bless you both. Have either of you read anything by... Now, I've never actually heard this name pronounced. This is a French last name. I think it's Mace, not... not. It looks like Maestra or something like this. Uh, but I think it's... And you could, you could correct me on this. It's Joseph de Mace, right? Um, no, I haven't. I, well, I've read quotations by him. The guy has some awesome quotations. But other than that... Um, never been keen on French philosophers apart from René Descartes. So uh, maybe someday, but yeah, uh, someone's going to have to give me a great reason to start trusting French philosophers because uh, <laughs> that's been one massive disaster for the past couple of, couple of centuries. Uh, grandma, <laughs> grandma, not my not actual not. grandma, the, the, the name grandma, uh, says, love hearing your testimonies and about Nabil and family. Well, you know, that's cool. And that, that's one of the reasons we... Um, wanted to go on live chat was because you know if people want to hear something want to hear a story then we can jump in there with it what uh, what was that you wanted to add something anthony uh no no <laughs> the, the occasion the moment has passed <laughs> all right uh so uh now we're going to go through uh go through a couple of um questions that have that have come about uh two of them are from Patrons, so um, if you, I forgot. I, actually, I forgot to post the uh, the Patreon link for Anthony. Anthony started a Patreon page yesterday. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that that Anthony works about seventy hours a week. And Anthony, what what did you? Uh, what is your educational background now? You just you just wrapped up. Just wrapped up what? Yeah, I just uh, completed a divinity degree at Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, uh, which. Uh, the, the original goal was to assume a pastoral position. Uh, that still may be what I do. It's still going to be ministerial, whatever I do, but uh, the form it might take uh, may, may differ. Uh, I have had, because of my background, uh, some interest for, for quite a while in prison ministry. And so there was an opportunity on the table to go and do that, and I'm not quite sure where that's at right now. But obviously it's not something that prisoners can support. You know, they're, they're on the receiving end. And so uh, even though I do it for free, I still have to have a way to support my family. So um, uh, I am looking for a way to do that um, that also, you know, meets that need. Uh, but so in the meantime, I'm, I'm sort of afloat looking for, for different things. Yeah. So now, now this is the this is the, the, the situation. Just so everyone knows the uh, the background here. Uh yeah, the the next the next natural step for someone who goes through um, the education that Anthony just went through would be to uh, become a pastor somewhere, uh, to to take a position at a at a church. But Anthony doesn't just know that stuff. He also happens to be extremely extremely knowledgeable about Islam, and that's far more rare. So my goal is to encourage people like Anthony, people who have done tons of research in Islamic studies and yet have a strong uh, background in Christianity as well and who can therefore uh, uh, respond to the objections of Muslims because they know Christianity and Christian theology well and they know Islam and what objections Muslims are going to bring out. We want to see people like Anthony um, we want to see people like Anthony uh, do what he's been what he's been gifted to do. So I would like to see him not go become a pastor somewhere, not because that's not a good thing. That is that is fundamental to Christianity, right? Churches, church leadership, and so on. Um, but there are other situations that have opened up to the church, like being able to talk to people around the world um, about things that they're not going to hear where they are. In other words, there are Muslims watching this right now, and will be watching it later, because it's uh, this will all be posted as a video. There are Muslims who will be watching this, in the Middle East, in Pakistan, um, across the Muslim world. There are Muslims who will be watching these programs. And the fact that right now we can reach Muslims 
who in their area are not going to hear the information that we're giving. They're not going to hear it from their leaders. They're not going to hear it from their imam. They're not going to hear it from their families. And we actually have the opportunity to reach Muslims around the world. I think the church needs to be taking the time that we're in extremely seriously and say that we have some amazing opportunities that we haven't had ever before. And so we need to take full advantage of that. So I encourage everyone to go uh, on Patreon, type in Anthony Rogers, Anthony's Patreon page. Again, just started it yesterday. will pop up. Uh, Anthony, if, if j just to be clear, if, because I, I haven't asked you this, but if you were fully funded to just focus on Islam and the objections of Muslims and apologetics dealing with Islam, would you actually rather do that, or would you rather do something else? Because some people would rather just be, would rather be, you know, a pastor or um, focus on on ministry in the local church versus uh, the sort of thing that I do. But because if you ask me, David, what do you want to do? I want to do exactly what I'm doing, right? I, I like sitting around. I like sitting in front of this bookshelf and making videos. Um, that's what I like to do. If I could choose anything in the world, this is what I would I would want to do. So, what sort of what 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 would you want to do if you if you had a choice? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd say that part of my issue has been that I have so many things that I'm interested in and I think equipped to do. Uh, so I mentioned the prison ministry thing. Obviously, I, I have a, uh, a sense of calling to that since I was converted in that context. And I know uh, that the Lord can change people's hearts. You know, I see what he's done in your case, and I know countless other people whose uh, lives have been radically changed. And so... Uh, I do have a heart for that. I uh, love to preach. I love uh, the church. And so those are two things that I love. But I also love evangelizing and engaging in apologetic uh, uh, the context uh, and disputes. I love to debate. I never feel more alive, I think, than when I'm debating. So uh, I guess, uh, you know, it's, it's hard for me to say on the spot uh, what I would do if I could choose just one. Uh, but as you know, I'm something of a, I mean, I work really hard. Currently, I'm working 70 hours a week just to, uh, you know, keep things going here while I look for what I'm going to do full time. But um, uh, in some ways, I'd like to find a situation where I could do everything at once. Uh, but <laughs> but I'm not sure if I can do that. So yeah, we'll I see like what that. happens. I like that, too. That there's there's a I wish there were like 80 hours in a day. <laughs> right. So I could, I could actually do everything that would that would that would be awesome. Um, we had uh, one super chat and then we're going to get to some questions um, that we're going to respond to. Uh, Julie asked, if you are majoring in ministry, what second language would you suggest a person know for the U.S. as a plus? Um, and, no, there. Ma ma so, majoring in ministry, what second language would you suggest? It, it kind of depends. Like, if you were going into, um, you know, New Testament studies, then obviously Greek or something like that. If you're just talking about like a language that someone might be speaking, and you 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 said specifically U.S. Well, the only other language besides English that has, you know, there are areas where um, it would be he really helpful to know would be would be Spanish, right? Is that what you'd say, Anthony? Yeah. 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 So yeah. All right, now let's go on to some uh, questions. From first, we'll we'll go through two from uh, from from some of my patrons here. Um, what is the difference between Sunni and Shia, and why do Sunnis not consider Shia as true Muslims? I have heard that Shias have closer ties with Christianity. Is it true? So Su Sunnis and Shias are the two main sects of Islam, and they they do have some differences in uh, some theological differences and uh, some other differences down the road, differences in practice and so on. They have a lot of similarity as well. But the divide ultimately goes back to Muhammad dying without clearly appointing a successor. So some Muslims said that the successor and leadership should be sort of the, the, the best Muslim in the community. And they regarded uh, Abu Bakr as the man to go to here. So uh, many people sided with Abu Bakr, saying that Abu Bakr should be the leader after Muhammad. Um, but others said, no, it, it should be someone in the family of Muhammad. And so uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib had married Muhammad's daughter. And so um, the claim was that uh, Ali should be the next leader. And he, he was also related to Muhammad. Um, so that was the claim. And then so there were Muslims who rallied around Ali. 
and uh, very quickly they started killing each other. In fact, Aisha, who was Abu Bakr's daughter and Muhammad's child bride, eventually marched an army out against Ali, and they fought what's called the Battle of the, the Camel. And about 10,000 Muslims died in bloody combat. Muslims who had been uh, on both sides of that battle, who had been alongside Muhammad at the battles of uh, Badr and Uhud and so on. And so we see very early on Muslims just slaughtering each other over disagreements. And the reason this is, this is disturbing is why would the first generation of Muslims just be fighting until they're almost annihilated, fighting each other, killing each other? And the reason is they'd had a, they learned a pattern from Muhammad. And that pattern, according to Muhammad, is you solve problems with violence. And uh, another problem with that whole situation is that Muhammad said the, the best generation of Muslims was the first generation. Well, the first generation of Muslims, which, which Muhammad said is the best generation, almost annihilated itself through violence. And so if that's your model, if that's your model for conduct, a, a generation that almost annihilated itself with violence, becomes very difficult for a Muslim today to say, hey, you know, Sunnis shouldn't be fighting Shias and Shias shouldn't be fighting Sunnis. What are you talking about? The best generation of Muslims did that. So, uh, so that's an ongoing problem. Uh, as far as Sunnis not considering Shias true Muslims, um, that's, not, that's not universal. You'll, you'll find, you'll, you, you will find Sunnis who say that Shias aren't real Muslims, and you will find Shias who say Sunnis aren't real Muslims, uh, but you'll also find them saying, no, they are, they're, they're, mis, they're misguided in some way, but they are still true Muslims. And uh, it's basically how seriously you interpret texts in the Quran, like chapter 33, verse 36, or chapter 4, verse 65, which command you to obey the uh, commands of Muhammad and Allah. And if you don't, then you're not a real Muslim. So it becomes very easy for Muslim to say, hey, you're not following this or that command of Allah or Muhammad, and therefore you're not a real Muslim. So that, that becomes a basis for Muslims to accuse other Muslims of not being Muslims. Um, here's another one from a patron. This is from Alan. He says, David, uh, Muslims are asking me, and uh, Anthony and I can both take a, take a crack at this one. David, Muslims are asking me, where is the gospel of Jesus? When I give them scriptures, they say, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or Paul, but Jesus. Can you show me the gospel of Jesus? I guess they want to see a book like one of the four gospels. I don't know. I'm not sure what they're asking. Maybe they don't either. Do you get this question? If so, how do you answer them? Thank you. So uh, the, the main, ob the, uh, if it, uh, Alan, if you don't know where this objection is coming from, it actually comes from uh, a confusion in the Muslim sources. So Anthony, where does this confusion arise from? Well, I'm not sure if this is where you're going, but I would say that Christians for quite a long time referred to the Gospels as simply the Gospel or the fourfold Gospel. Yeah, well, go, go, going back, going back, is, uh, I was just mentioning that the confusion in the Muslim sources is because um, on the one hand, they're talking about the Gospel as a book that Christians are reading in the seventh century. But right. the Quran also talks about the Gospel as something that was given to Jesus. And so Muslims are thinking, oh, so there's a book given to Jesus. So when you Christians are talking about the gospel, you must be referring to a, a book by Jesus, like Allah says. And therefore, what's it? Don't be talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Where's this book of Jesus? So what? What? Uh, what's the problem there? Well, of course, uh, the gospel isn't, never was. Uh, a specific book or a single book given to the Lord Jesus or something that Jesus wrote. Wait, wait, uh, wait. The wait, so, so there's never been a book that is a, a, a supposedly a book given by Jesus? No. Okay. So, so, <laughs> so, so when a prophet comes along and starts referring about a book given to Jesus, we would, we would have to conclude that he's a false prophet because there's not a shred of evidence anywhere that ever, any such book ever existed? Right. Okay. Now, right. Uh, another thing is that if you want to say that uh, Muhammad was right, and it simply refers to one book, uh, what's ironic is that the most likely candidate, according to the Islamic sources, is the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. If you look at even Itzhak's uh, Surat Rasulullah, uh, you actually find some uh, discussion of portions of John's Gospel, although it, it gets things uh, a bit confused. Uh, but it's John's gospel that uh, seems to be the one, if any, that is known to at least some of Muhammad's contemporaries and companions. 
at least that we have evidence of in in Islam sources. Uh, so, you know, so the irony is, of course, that John's gospel is the one that Muslims most want to deny its authenticity and, uh, you know, authority. Uh, but then the other thing that I would say is what I was what I was getting at before is that the the gospel in particular is the life, death, burial and resurrection of Christ. The four accounts that we have are of the gospel. They're not separate gospels in the sense that they're separate messages. They're all setting forth the same person and work of the Lord Jesus. And so that's why you have actually the titles of the gospels. uh, Most people don't know this, but the titles or superscriptions that you have at the beginning of all the gospels, those aren't things that were added centuries later. Those are things that appear on all of our gospel manuscripts th- throughout the world, no matter how far back in history you go. So there's a uniformity in all of the manuscripts attributing the gospels to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But what they say is, they don't say the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark. It says it simply says, kata matheon, according to Matthew, kata markon, according to Mark. And what it means is this is the gospel, the one gospel, according to Matthew. This is how Matthew is uh, recounting it for us. And so really we only have one gospel, but we have it uh, through four uh, witnesses. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is, by the way, Muslims, if you are, we're trying to help you here, right? Not just, (laughs) uh, not just trying to help you uh, recognize the truth and, and to to see the problems of uh, of what Muhammad claimed, uh, we're we're trying to help you to reconcile even the the various claims of the Quran because once you do that, it's going to show you what what the real problem is. Um, so think about this: uh, the Quran claims it that Jesus came with the gospel, but the Quran also refers to the gospel as a as a book. Now, if you put those together and say, therefore. The gospel that was being referred to here is a book that was revealed to Jesus and that Jesus delivered this actual book. Then it's clear that your prophet is a false prophet, right? Because guess what? Muhammad says, the Quran says in Surah 4, I mean, Surah 7, verse 157, that Jews and Christians were still reading the Torah and the gospel during the time of Muhammad. So Muhammad is around in the 7th century. So if you're taking this as a book given to Jesus, then that means there was a book given to Jesus that was still around in the 7th century. That means it was around in the 1st century, the 2nd century, the 3rd century, the 4th century, the 5th century, the 6th century, and the 7th century. Somehow it was reliably transmitted all the way down from the 1st century to the 7th century and all the way into Arabia. So this was a widespread, well-known book. There is not a shred of evidence that there was ever any book given to Jesus that was that was delivered. If there was a book given to Jesus, no one ever heard of it. We have no record that it existed. So if that so if that's what you think the Quran means, then we can't take you seriously, right? If the Quran is referring to a book given to Jesus that survived into the seventh century and all the way across the Middle East, then we can't take you seriously because we we would be aware of a book like that. So that's a problem, and there's a way out. There's a way out for you. And one, the, the way out is to conclude that when the Quran refers to the gospel that was given to Jesus and yet also refers to a book that Christians read that's called the gospel, it's talking about two different and yet related things. Because guess what? Christians use the, the word gospel in exactly the same way. The Christians that Muhammad would have encountered use the term gospel in exactly the same way. They refer to the gospel as the message that Jesus brought. So Jesus came with the gospel. Jesus preached the gospel. Gospel means good news. So it's a message that Jesus brought. But if you're referring to a book, as Anthony pointed out, uh, the four gospels were treated as one book called the fourfold gospel. And uh, uh, also, as, as Anthony mentioned, if you want to treat, if you want to go with one gospel and say what one book is this referring to, um, and then the, the the one in the earliest Muslim sources is the Gospel of John. And notice when 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 Muslims have to answer, well, where? Where does the gospel talk about Muhammad? They would start quoting the gospel of John here. So they didn't have some other book. Do do, do you see the problem here? The early Muslim community is referring to the gospel. And that there are prophecies about Muhammad in the gospel. And when you ask the early Muslim community, 
what are you talking about? They don't say, oh, we're, ta we're talking about this, the gospel of Jesus here that, that was written by Jesus. They never, they don't, the early Muslim community doesn't say that. They say, oh yeah, right here, the gospel of John. This is where we get it from. So it's clear that this is what the early Muslim community was thinking of. So the only way to reconcile uh, the Quranic claims that the gospel is brought by Jesus, one, and two, that the gospel is a book that Christians were reading is exactly the same way Christians use these terms, that Jesus brought the gospel, the good news, and yet the books that the Christians wrote were collected into a collection called the fourfold gospel or simply the gospel. And that's the collection of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's what it means when it's referring to a text. So the Quran refers to a book that's being read in the seventh century by Christians. What book is that? Well, we know what it is. And if the Quran means something else, the Quran should specify what it means. And if you think it means some book given to Jesus, you've got a huge problem on your hands. Because according to chapter seven, I mean to chapter five, verse forty seven, Christians are commanded to judge by the gospel. If you think that what Allah means there is judge by this book that Jesus brought, and it's commanding Christians, that not Christians in the first century, Christians in the seventh century and onward, to judge by the gospel, and you think it means a book given to Jesus? We don't have that book, ladies and gentlemen. So Allah is telling us to judge by a book that we don't have, and we can never have any evidence that it even existed. So if we take the claims the way Muslims take them, we have to regard this, we have to regard Islam and the Quran and Muhammad as, as just utter nonsense and a false prophet, because you can't make sense of it. Allah can't be commanding us to judge by something that we don't have. Chapter 5, verse 68 says, we have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the Torah and the gospel. Well, how do we stand upon the gospel if we don't have it? So if, if you'd say to a Christian for the first several centuries of Christianity leading up to Muhammad, and you say, judge by a gospel, and I'm referring to the book, any Christian would think you mean the fourfold gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were treated as a unit called the gospel. So if you're referring to a text, that means that. If you're saying it means something else, then Allah really needs to be more clear. In other words, imagine if I come up to you Muslims and I say, you Muslims judge by the Quran, and then I walk away and I don't say anything else. Well, you would assume I mean the Quran, right? The, the, the one that you have on your shelf, you would assume that that's what I mean, right? What if I didn't mean that? I meant some other book that you never, that you never had and you've never heard of, and there's no evidence that it even existed. Well, then you'd start thinking I'm just incoherent, right? I'm not making any sense. I'm telling you to do things that you can't possibly do, and I'm being hopelessly unclear. So if Allah is telling Christians judge by the gospel, and the, the, the book that we have that is called the gospel is the collection of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you're telling us Allah meant something else, then you're telling us that Allah is a horrible communicator who can't explain what he means. And this in spite of the fact that the Quran over and over and over again claims to be perfectly clear in its commands. If Allah meant some other book that we don't have, then Allah is not clear and the Quran is wrong. So, um, so Alan, if, uh, if that's the, the objection your friends are using, you've got some, some slam dunk material to, uh, to go on for that. All right, uh, uh, Anthony wanted to jump in on a super chatter right here, and I want to try this again where I actually insert the super chat comment. Pow! That is, that is nifty right there. So Jordan Marshall says, Hey David, why do Muslims insist that the Quran is perfect from the time of Muhammad, and yet historically the Quran comes out the 8th century with changes, and the Hadith history say it's changed? So Anthony, why do Muslims insist that the Quran is perfect from the time of Muhammad when the evidence says it's not? Well, I guess for the same reason convicts say they, they didn't commit the crime, <laughs> even though the evidence says they did. Uh, Muslims need to say that it's perfectly preserved in order to uh, keep up the charade. If they grant that it's been corrupted, then uh, they obviously have a problem. Uh, but I, I think part of what's uh, driving it is the is their peculiar version of inspiration. As Christians, we believe that the Bible was uh, inspired, which means that the authors of Scripture were supernaturally superintended, that God used them without destroying their wills or their personalities and so forth, but he used them to write what he wanted them to write. And then thereafter, God used normal means to preserve his word. You know, he's, he's guiding all of history, so he can do things supernaturally. He can also use ordinary means. And through those ordinary means, there are uh, copyist errors that can creep in, and happily there are ways to 
uh, sort out those sorts of mistakes. A lot of them just end up being uh, simple spelling mistakes or um, minor differences like uh, one of the peculiarities of Greek is that uh, when you when it mentions a name, it often puts the definite article before it, but we don't translate that into English because it doesn't make any sense to us. Uh, but for example, when Mark 1, uh, 2 says, as it is written in uh, Isaiah the prophet, it says, as it is written in the Isaiah the prophet. Uh, so in some uh, copies of the, the New Testament, you'll have the article dropped because it's unnecessary to the sense. And so those are the sorts of things that you'll see uh, differing among uh, New Testament manuscripts, and that doesn't really amount to anything. Uh, we still have the same message, and we're even able to discern by comparing and collating manuscripts uh, where some of these mistakes were made. Uh, but Muslims think that the Quran is Allah's eternal speech, and so they can't, in light of that, uh, you know, come to terms with the idea that there could be mistakes in Allah's eternal speech. I would, it would, uh, I guess, in their minds, mean that Allah's stuttering or something, mm -hmm. uh, or somehow uh, uh, fumbling his words. And, uh, but also, I think that part of what drives it is simply the apologetic uh, value they think it, it gives them. Uh, they think if they can claim the Quran has never had copyist errors, which we know it has, uh, then somehow that gives them a leg up on Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's kind of odd because, I mean, you can pick up. Uh, I thought I had my Yusuf Ali here, but you could pick up Yusuf Ali's translation of the Quran, and you can read him in footnotes making observations yeah. about uh, Quranic variants. And he's not even bringing up all of them; he's just bringing up a, a few here and there. Uh, but it's yeah, it's not I, like it's yeah. And, and anyone, who wants, anyone who wants to check that get 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 the Yusuf Ali edition of the Quran where he he includes the footnotes. And go to chapter thirty three, verse six, because there's actually a verse there where Yusuf Ali apparently likes a variant better. In other words, if you, if you Muslims don't know what we're talking about, there are variants in your sources. Um, and in other words, different Muslims had different, well, if you go back, different Muslims had in, in, entirely different chapters in their Qurans. Um, uh, uh, Ubay ibn Qab had 116 chapters in his Quran. You have 114 chapters in yours. Abdullah ibn Masud had 111 chapters in his Quran. Again, you have 114 in yours. And these weren't random guys, right? These were... Uh, Ubay ibn Kaab and Abdullah ibn Masud were two of the guys Muhammad said, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from these four guys. And those were two of the guys. And so Ubay ibn Kaab also had additional phrases and so on. You know what his problem was? He had a great memory. Other Muslims would forget things and things would drop out. And Ubay would have such a good memory that he wouldn't forget it. And so later when Muslims are reciting the Quran in a different way, Ubay would say, well, no, this is the way Muhammad revealed it. And then he would be, they wouldn't like that. They would, they would get mad at him for having such a, a, a great memory. But, um, yeah, so I, I would actually draw a distinction here between Muslim scholars and your average Muslim. Because your average Muslim, the reason he believes that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter is just that's what he been, he's been told all his life by his imam and his parents. That's it. It doesn't go any deeper than that. He didn't come to this conclusion after examining the manuscripts. He didn't come to this conclusion from going to the Muslim sources and seeing what they say about the, the history of the text of the Quran. He's just been told that. So your average Muslim who says this, he's not trying to trick you, he's not trying to deceive you. He really believes that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. But it's because he's been told a bunch of nonsense by his leaders. So that's a situation with your average Muslim. Now what disturbs me is the Muslim leaders who've read the same sources that, that, Anthony, that Anthony and I read, right? So your Muslim leaders who've read the Muslim sources, they know that entire chapters came up missing, that large passages came up missing, that verses were eaten by a sheep. They know that this is what your sources say about the history of its text. And yet they go on to tell people the Quran's been perfectly preserved right down to the letter, never a single change, not to a letter. And so if you've read the Muslim sources, you know this is a lie. And yet they continue telling your average Muslim perfect preservation. Why? Because as Anthony pointed out, it has apologetic value, right? This gives Muslims a false confidence in their book and allows them to go out to their Christian friends and say, oh, you see that? You Christians, you can go into any Christian bookstore and read a book about textual criticism. Now, why? Is, well, by the way, why is that? It's because Christians are honest, right? Christians are honest with the evidence and they take the evidence seriously and they do textual criticism to get back to the original reading. Um, but Muslims just ignore all of that and pretend that it didn't happen. 
And so this allows the Muslim to go and say, hi, you Christians, you see, you admit that you have textual variants. In Islam, there's never been a textual variant. And it's absolute nonsense. And yet Muslim leaders keep telling Muslims this. Why? Because it gives them a false confidence. Now, that, that, that has worked well for Muslims because you can go up to any Muslim and one of his first claims out of his mouth, Quran's been perfectly preserved. This proves that it's the word of God. And most Christians don't know enough to actually respond to that. But Muslims have set themselves up for a massive fall here. They've set themselves up for a massive fall. Because once you've built your case and people's confidence on a foundation of lies and outright deception such that anyone who spends five minutes actually examining this issue will realize that it's, it's, their heads have been filled with false claims, you've set yourself up for a fall. Because all we need, all we need is a well-informed group of Christian apologists to actually read what's in your sources and wreak absolute havoc on the false claims that you that you spread. And now Muslims are going to start to realize, wait a minute, my leaders told me all my life the Quran has been perfectly preserved, and yet that's a lie. If they lied to me about that, what else have they lied to me about? Uh, all right, Anthony, we have... Uh, um, we actually had several more things that we wanted to respond to. That's no problem since we're uh, going on tomorrow night as well. We can; uh, th Those are already queued up for tomorrow. Wanted to address one more super chatter here because it's a quick one. Um, Wade says, uh, how frequently do you two read the Quran and the Hadith? It must be unpleasant. I can't speak for Anthony, but I read some of the Quran and the Hadith pretty much every day uh because that that's 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 what i do uh but anthony you've been studying christianity for a while so how, how frequently are you studying the muslim sources yeah so um with the quran uh, for quite a while i was pretty consistently reading through it i've read through it i don't know how many times quite a number of times uh but it, it came to the point where I started doing a lot of more a lot more detailed analysis so that I was going much slower. So I continue to read through the Islamic sources. I have a portion of every day uh, devoted to that. Uh, but I'm also working my way through uh, Ahmed uh, bin Hanbal's uh, Musnad. So uh, this one's volume one. I'm actually reading volume three at the moment. But... Uh, yeah, so obviously there's not only the Quran but the Hadiths, and uh, you know, while reading the Quran and the Hadith can be nauseating at times, there's also a lot of entertainment value there. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are things that, that keep you going. Uh, uh, yeah, I won't I won't say too much to open up a whole can of worms here, but uh, <laughs> yes, I, I'll, I'll say this: uh, there 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 are lo there's lots of material in the Hadith that's that's sort of painful to read because it's just. It's just so, you know, so weird and out there. But there, there's, there's lots of interesting material in the hadiths. Uh, the Quran is absolutely, hands down, the, the worst thing that anyone could possibly read. I would, if, if it weren't for, you know, if it weren't for the apologetics aspect, I would actually rather read a phone book than the Quran. And I'm not saying that because I disagree with it. I disagree with David Hume. I love reading David Hume. I disagree with Plato on a lot of things. I, I love reading Plato. So it's not just that I disagree with it. It's that it, it is painful to read. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we, we, we read it, but it's because we have to, not because it's, uh, it, it's, it's great literature or something like that. And I would agree with uh, Anthony Flew, who was comparing the, uh, the Bible and the Quran, referring to the time when he was an atheist. Uh, he said that uh, the Bible, regardless of your perspective, is, a, is an outstanding work of literature. Uh, to read the Quran is to do penance, right? This is, where you, this is where you punish yourself for your sins. All right, well, uh, we're actually out of time. Tomorrow we wanted to discuss uh, Jeremiah 8.8. 8. That's a verse that Muslims use to try and show that the Bible admits that it's been corrupted. We're going to take a look at that tomorrow. We'll get to that tomorrow, and we'll have a lot more issues to cover. Uh, tomorrow, same time, same channel. See you then. And now we have to click finish again, and this cuts off at random time. So, uh, sinister stare there, Anthony.